What is happening, YouTube? Blamer Keith here representing Formula Golf out here at Verona. Getting ready to do some practicing in, but before I do that, I want to answer some of the questions you guys left me in my most recent video. I'm going to go through them. I, I haven't really given them uh, much thought as I've looked, so this is kind of on the fly. So I'm going to go through it, starting with the very first one. What kind of music do you like? Um, I like a decent amount of music. Uh, Certain music I listen to maybe when I practice and be a little bit different. I, I listen to a lot of classical music when I practice. Uh, I like Bach, I like Mozart. But my favorite, my favorite musician, his name is Sufjan Stevens. Uh, I, someone I've liked since I was in high schoolish or so, and then uh, and I've grown to just like more and more as I've gotten older, which is a which is not something that normally happens when you listen to certain musicians. So Sufjan Stevens is my guy. That's the kind of music I listen to more so than anything. The most amount of money I have ever won from an individual golf tournament is actually $4,000 and I won it. I know it's not that much, but most mini tour events you're not going to get more than $4,000. It was actually a one, day, a one day event, so that was nice. And then I ended up buying a car at, right after that. I was in my, my early 20s and uh, it actually really helped me out big time. I, I had missed getting into the Monday qualifier for Farmers Insurance Open by one shot and I, went, and I was all bummed out because I doubled the last hole to miss it by one shot. And I went back to my car and there was like a note for this up and coming tour that was left on all, all the, the windshields of the cars. And so I took a look at that and the money I would have spent towards the Monday qualifier was spent towards that and I went out and won. And then I won the following week after that too. So that really actually helped me out big time because I did not have a car at that point. So that was pretty sweet. Noah Dawson writes, what golfer has inspired you most? Obviously it's going to be Tiger Woods because I probably never would have started playing golf if not for Tiger Woods. I, my earliest memory of watching golf was when I was seven years old maybe or eight and Tiger won the 97 Masters. And then uh, a couple years after that I picked up my first club when I was nine and I didn't play my first round of golf until I was 11 and watching Tiger win the US Open by 15 changed the whole game for me. I just thought I wanted to be just like that guy. But other motivators of mine was uh, growing up especially was Lee Elder and Calvin Peet two childhood heroes of mine and very specifically childhood heroes of my dad. Um, many of you might not know this but my dad is black and he's at, he, if he was still alive he would have been in his early 70s and he had a dream of being a professional golfer but at the time that he was growing up they didn't allow him to play a lot of golf courses. He made it into sectionals of the US Open I believe in the like 1960 or something like that and he was like 12 years old. And I don't think he was allowed to play in that one. So he always was talk about Lee Elder, about uh, you know how great of a person he was. And I happened to meet Lee Elder when I was a little kid at the Hodges Golf Driving Range in Escondido. And uh, ever, ever since then, I, I've kind of been on and off seeing him and talking to him over the years. And uh, just the nicest, classiest guy. So Tiger Woods, Calvin Pete, and Lee Elder were my guys that inspired me for golf. Here's a Vincent asked, how much time do you spend practicing a week and do you work out to help your game at all? I spend virtually every day practicing, uh, I mean I guess you can call it virtually, five to six days a week I'll practice in some form or another, practice or play. I work out three or four times a week. I try to go every other day to kind of give your body a little bit of a break and then go on to the next one and uh, I don't do anything too hard on days that I'm going from the gym straight to practice but I mainly work on flexibility. I can't gain weight no matter what I try to do, so staying flexible is the number one thing for me right now. DH asks, any tip for a fellow skinny guy at 135 pounds increasing club head speed? Just maximize your rotation and maximize your flexibility. You know, I'm assuming since you're skinny and relatively tall, I'm only 138 pounds, so I know your pain of being in the 130s. Um, you know, work on a lot of core strength if you can. Go out to the gym. You know. You, your chances are you're not going to bulk up until a later age anyway. So work on flexibility and work on proper rotation. You know, making sure that right hip stays high as you turn is really important for skinny players to get as much out of their frame as possible. Hamilton McNaughton asks, I have a question that I have been wanting to ask for a while and I was wondering if you could help me. Is it worth it to pay the upcharge for Shaft's new driver? I played a 917 D3 with the Diamana Blue Boar 60X. My numbers are good. But from your experience, is it worth to pay up for an upcharged shaft and will it improve your overall game? The Diamana 60X is a plenty dang good shaft, uh, but I would, if I were you, study up on what stock shafts might work best for you if you don't want to spend the extra $200 on an upcharged shaft. For instance, like a Diamana blue board is going to fly different than a red board or a white board, so find out what your spin rates are if you can ever even go to like your local golf store if they have any kind of foresight or 
you know, TrackMan, anything like that on there, and just find out like if you're low spinning it with your with your blue board, then you probably need something that gets a little bit more spin. And they have stock shafts in Diamana and a lot of other like Fujikuras. So most most companies now have really good stock shafts. I wouldn't personally go for the higher end shaft because you can get the probably close to the same numbers on a stock shaft if you have it right for your swing. So is it worth it? It's all subjective to what makes you feel most confident, but uh, I personally don't go out of my way to get the super nice shaft. Larry Lasky asks, what do you work on your mental game beyond the mental scorecard, like meditation, other games, any book recommendations, and what do you enjoy outside of golf? Um, I do work on mental game, but it's mainly like uh, like past tense after golf tournaments. Like I'll go back and kind of look into what I did right, what I did wrong, what feelings I had in certain situations. Uh, that's always a really good way to learn from your tournament rounds. I think you get the most mentally, most out of it mentally doing that. Uh, there's a book called Golf Is Not a Game of Perfect, I believe, that I really like. Um, from uh, no, not Geo Valiant Day was. Uh, Dang, I wish I had it. It was a really good book. I think that might actually be it, but uh, I'm just not sure if that was uh, if that's the the same one. I mix them up kind of. I've read those books. Uh, you know, it's amazing to see the similarities between how certain pros think or act when they're going poorly to how a lot of people on mini tours, especially, act. I think the mental part of mini tour people is that really holds them down because a, a lot of guys out that I play around with have you know just as much talent as anybody on tour, but. There seems to be a block, and you know, same for me in, in the same case. So, yeah, that, that seems to be the one. And then, um, what else was the when you asked? Oh, and what do I draw out outside of golf? I enjoy studying a lot on history. Uh, very specifically, I'm, I'm a big World War One buff, which is a you know not something that I tell many people about. But outside of golf, I like to study up on that and learn 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 everything about it. There's, you can never not learn enough about World War One. So. Other than that, I like hanging out with my girlfriend, obviously. Uh, we like to go out and every once in a while. and I don't drink very often, but uh, she, she enjoys it, so every once in a while I'll go out with her and do that. Let's see. Did you... Ooh, this is going to be a tough name to, 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 to pronounce here. Eon O'Shaughnessy? Let me know if I got that right. He asks, did you play golf, and is golf your sole source of income? Uh, unfortunately, I did not play college golf. I got sponsored in high school by Wilson staff, and after high school, I was working for them, kind of doing like demo days and stuff like that, and I just figured that that would be the kind of job that I wanted to do anyways, because I knew I was going to be uh, working in the golf industry at some point, you know, at least at the time, that's what I thought. Uh, big regret of mine, because I really sacrificed four years of consistent tournament golf that I would not have had. And that I did not have when I first turned pro because of lack of money. But I fully expected that if golf didn't work out, I would have worked for them. And then later on, it was the same kind of things with Adams Golf. I thought I was going to be working for the company. And, you know, I, it, those aren't in the cards for my future is working in the golf industry other than playing. Uh, as of right now, it is my sole source of income. Only because my sponsors basically, you know, I don't have to pay rent, which is great. I don't have to pay membership fees or, you know, car insurance and stuff like that. I get kind of like a little bit of an allowance. So... I guess you can say that golf is my income. I treat it like a job now. Uh, I wake up, go to the gym, practice for eight hours. You know, just kind of put in your actual work in for the day, like you would be if you're going to a you know a nine to five job. So for now, it is, and hopefully it remains that way. Ollie Moore Golf, what's your main swing thought? It depends on uh, on certain things that I'm working on. Uh, I find that when I'm hitting it really well. And I'm kind of like in like a little bit of a zone. I only really ever think about my head being still so I don't come up and out of it. I, you know, head still going back and head still going down through. And I find that I can really rotate easier that way. Whereas sometimes I get up, you know, like this and my left shoulder comes up a little bit. But when I'm swinging well, that's my main swing thought. Uh, right now, it's faster hands to, to get my, my hands in front of me. Ahmad Redis asks... How would you approach a one-day qualifier? I have signs of being able to play professionally, but I don't have the confidence level I need. Um, one-day qualifiers are actually pretty fun, and I find not overly difficult, except for Monday qualifiers. Those are extremely difficult because you have to shoot six under par in those, and if you make a, a bogey and you're like one over after four or something like that, it's basically a wrap. You're not going to be shooting six under par, barring a miracle. And it's really hard to get yourself mentally, you know, outside of the that 
for, for pre-qualifiers when you have to shoot one or two hundred to get through or even uh, US Open uh, regional qualifiers I think the crucial thing for one day qualifiers would be just to be really patient on the first four or five holes you know hit hit don't aim at flags trying to make that early birdie as much as getting yourself in a rhythm is really important because you'd be surprised if you're not making bogeys and you're even par after the fifth hole you pepper in a birdie on seven maybe one on ten and after 13 holes you're three under par on cruise control and it gives you kind of a cushion where if you were to make a late bogey on 16 or something you know you can close out and shoot the 60s which will get you through most pre-qualifiers and most US Open uh, regional qualifiers you know not making bogeys on the first few holes and just having a rhythm you can turn a 300 par round from after hole 10 into a 600 700 par round really fast because you you have that rhythm in a couple putts going in is all it takes to really get to that next level so my advice would be on the first four or five holes don't be super aggressive you know it's okay to make pars on the first few holes it gets you it gets your comfort level really really stable it, it doesn't give you the ups and downs you get when you start off trying to attack something make a stupid dumb mistake and have that to work back from Dave Mack asks sometimes your follow through looks like tigers when hitting irons any thoughts <laughs> I, I I mean that'd be cool if I felt like it did I, but um, you know when I was a kid I used to actually hit golf shots by copying how Tiger Woods used to finish I don't do it anymore it's just that's just what it naturally comes comes into now but I used to really try to do the high follow through for the and like the little floaty hands for the high fade and lows at the hips for the low stinger. So Tiger was definitely a big uh, a big copying point of mine. So if it looks like that, it might be remnants of my past swings. Charlie Yu, the man, the one and only, asked me, do you have a separate short game coach, mainly putting? If not, have you considered Xander Shopley's or Charlie Hoffman's coach? Uh, you're talking about Derek Ueda. I have actually considered him. Um, my Myself and my sponsor went through different coaches I can kind of go to and he popped up and you know he's like $300 an hour so that was just kind of it was just too much money uh, as you know I went to Chris Mason as well for a little while great coach I love him he's a super awesome guy but he's travels a lot and he has he deals with a lot of uh, LBGA and PGA Pro so he's on retainer all the time so he's not often available especially enough for me to to warrant you know paying the money that I was paying him to do it so that's just one of the reasons why I went to Adam is because of availability so I see putting and short game with him Adam's short game is top of the line so uh, I definitely learned a lot from him but I also pick up a lot of short game knowledge from guys like Sam Chan and you know it, Todd Beck it really helps to just watch and pick their brains a lot too is Adam Porzak teaching style similar to Ben Hogan and Jimmy Ballard I wouldn't say no um, Though I'm not so positive on what Jimmy Ballard or Ben Hogan's teaching styles are, but I would say that they're not very similar. Do you have a B plan? Not meant any negative or downing comment or saying you should just think of just what what's your mindset? Do you have a B plan? Um, I do have a B plan. It's not necessarily something that I want to do, but something that I can do. Uh, I know some people in the finance industry, and uh, and I, I got a job if I really wanted to as a title rep for a real estate company. Um, that's what I would do immediately if you know five years from now golf hasn't worked. That's just a nice fast way to kind of get in your feet into something and make make quick money quickly. That's not something that I would want to do forever because, as you know, life is all about doing what makes you happy because you can't just live just to live otherwise you'll be miserable you want to strive towards something so I would probably work as a title rep for a little while save up some money and I would really like to maybe become like a history teacher or something I'd like to move to Europe and uh, you know do some uh, do some stuff involving World War one in either France or Belgium I know that's a it's a it's hard to get citizenship in other countries but that's basically what I have in mind is something I could be passionate about going forward if golf doesn't work out. So, Stephen McPherson asks, how much have you improved since you started working with Adam Porzak? Uh, also, what's your swing thought when you use his method? Um, but I would say I improved a lot under Adam, uh, like big time, uh, because the the times when when things are going bad in golf tournaments, when, when you're, you're feeling like you're stuck or you're swinging it poorly and you're, hit, you're spraying it all over the place, it can really get away from you if you don't know what pieces need to be put back together in order for you to execute and hit a proper golf shot. So under Adam, I've been able to kind of 
self-diagnose the problems a lot faster. So my rounds that could be two or three over are now one under, two under, even par. Uh, you know, and that's a really important thing under Adam. Uh, so the swing thoughts I have basically is just get the club in front of you, in front of your body, and then turn. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. You know, it's not. I'm not trying to manipulate anything to get that turn. It's just, but that is a swing thought. Make sure I get the club in front of my body, in whatever feel possible. <laughs> George Gonzalez asks, were your past golf lessons in Hawaii with Kelvin beneficial, or did they end up hurting your game any? What would you say would be the main difference between someone like Kelvin and Adam's instruction? Good luck this year. Thanks, George. Um, Kelvin actually saved any chance of me wanting to play golf in the future. I, like Before I went to him, I had some debilitating hooks, and I, I was on the verge of quitting, to be honest. And after seeing Kelvin, I didn't hit a hook shot for like four years. It was incredible. If it weren't for him, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't even be playing golf still. So special thanks to Kelvin there. Um, I will say different stuff between Adam and Kelvin is uh, is Kelvin doesn't necessarily teach like a very specific system the way that Adam does that he's passionate about that he believes is, would elevate everyone's game. Kelvin is more of a finding out why and what you do well in your swing that you can improve on and and virtually master and, and get the most out of. So obviously. It's just they're just some kind, some little bit of different teaching styles, but from what I learned with Kelvin was top of the line, and you know I wouldn't be able to do any most of the stuff that I'm doing with Adam without what I was started doing with Kelvin. So it's all kind of a progression into uh, what I'm working on now. Wooden of the Angles asks, you didn't mention the Be Better Golf Challenge event. I really enjoyed that. Maybe that should be my question for you. What was it like to play in? How nervous were you, especially when you knew you could win it? And what was it like to play with Monty Scheinblum? Um, let's see. It was awesome to play in because Rams Hill is the best golf course in San Diego, I think, by far. Um, now, I, I wasn't nervous when I thought I could win it. I only ever get nervous when I when negative stuff comes in. When it comes to positivity, like things like winning and wanting to win gets me pumped up and takes away nerves, but the the fear of failure is what gets me nervous. To be honest, I was very nervous going into that because I was putting horrifically. And in that, in that, uh, I, for the first 14 holes or so of that match, I was putting really bad. And, uh, and I knew I was putting bad. So I switched my grip actually that morning to a cross-handed. I was putting with a claw grip and I was just completely lost. And I thought, you know, if I don't hit it well, I'm going to lose kind of thing. And thankfully, I, I actually struck it pretty solid all day. I don't think I hit really any bad shots. I just uh, missed a ton of putts. Uh, Monty's super a super nice guy, and he hits it way better than I think the camera gives him justice. The way he hits it, the way it sounds, how far he hits it, very impressive. And I, I wish him all the best. I hope uh, you know his his body can hold up so he can give the Champions Tour a real run because he hits it probably 30 yards by everyone else on that tour. So. It was, I was, it was really fun, and Brendan was a great host, and, uh, and the people he brought along to film, were, it was fantastic. We couldn't have asked for anything more. Eric Hurt asks, do you plan to play with Golfholics? When, you, when are you coming back to AZ? Uh, I would love to play with Golfholics again. I really, really like, uh, like Marco and Mike. They're fantastic people. I've, we obviously had a collaboration when they were a young, upstarting YouTube channel. I think they had like 200 subscribers when me and Gabe went out and played with them. Now they're steadily on the rise becoming one of the biggest YouTube channels for golf out there uh, which makes it probably a little bit more difficult for me to get in with them they probably have a lot of a, a, a nice schedule lined up with a lot of other people and other collaborations but I'd love to get out there again with them I'd love to have them come out to Steel Canyon because I think their drone shots will look really cool out at my home course uh, and I'll be in Arizona actually uh, I think next month in February uh, Gabe is moving back out there to film more videos actually more golf stuff in just a couple weeks, so I'll be out there a lot more often. I got my really good friend Tim Collins out there who's been featured in a few of my videos. Really become a really good friend of mine, someone who's reached out to me and asked for lessons. And you know, my girlfriend goes to school at NAU up in Flagstaff, so it works out to stop halfway. And he's just become a really good friend of mine through the years, so I'm always down to go visit him and I'll be sure to film. So I'll be out there in February sometime. Chris Baker asks, Ah, I hope I can play your home course in Veracruz, that'd be sweet. Uh, were you always unnaturally long as a kid, or did your swing develop over time, harnessing more and more power? Also, how old were you when you shot your first round under par? Um, 
I was actually unnaturally long my whole life, which is kind of a, a weird thing. I don't know exactly how I did it. I played baseball before I ever played golf, uh, you know, so I think a lot of that got incorporated with my golf swing. And uh, if you've seen a lot of Kelvin's videos, you know, the way baseball players rotate can really help with golf. And so I think that I, that really helped me out. Um, my first round under par was when I was 12. And I birdied my last five holes at Eagle Crest to shoot 69, and it was in the rain, and I'll never forget it because the course was pretty much closed. I used to love going out when I was a kid because I had no money, so I'd get dropped off when it rained and sneak out. But one of the cart guys was nice enough to actually give me a cart, so that was really fun because uh, that was the first time I ever drove a golf cart. And uh, I went and drove a golf cart, and I finished off one incredible round, and that was the first time I shot under par, first round in the 60s, and I, I want to say I didn't shoot in the 60s again until I was like 14 or something like that. Matthew Bowen asks, was there a big jump from being an amateur to, to a professional in the skill level of people you played with? Uh, yes, most definitely. When I was in high school, uh, I was in a really bad league. I was in like a division four school. I went to a charter school the two years I played high school golf and uh, they weren't the best kids. Like we weren't playing against like Torrey Pines High and stuff like that. So obviously in CIF, when you get there, a lot of kids, you know, like Ricky Fowler was winning CIF that, that those years and a lot of really good players that made really nice careers for themselves. But the people I mainly played with as an amateur was, they, you know, they were just normal kids. And so when I turned professional, playing with people who can shoot 65 was, I wouldn't say like a big shock, but definitely, uh, you know, you definitely you gotta realize you got to step up your game. Miguel Lee says, do you have a player that you model your swing or playing style after? I do not. When I was a kid, I, tr I tried to pretend I was Tiger Woods, and um, you know my swing never looked like Tiger Woods at any point ever. And you know there, there's different feels that that you see on TV when I growing up. Like I remember when McIlroy was coming out in like 2011, I was like, oh maybe if I turn more going back and make sure I turn all the way going through, I'll play. You know that looks really good. And honestly, I played really good, really really well at that point in time for a while. I was winning tournaments and shooting course records and stuff. But you know, those swing thoughts are all fleeting you know, in the end, like how you model your swing after somebody, you're not gonna be able to do it forever. And in the end, you have to own your own swing, which is where I'm at right now. And let's see. And Roar Lieb, I think this is gonna be my last question actually. Are you someone with natural golf talent or did you have to start from ground zero in developing your abilities? Along the way, were you any major breakthroughs, breaking 80, getting the scratch, etc.? Kind of uh, goes back to one of the questions I answered about my first under par round. Uh, I w was lucky enough to, when I started hitting golf shots on the range, I was able to actually start hitting golf shots like like pretty fast. Like I wasn't topping it or shanking it. I was able to hit. Uh, my family's pretty coordinated, so I think that uh, that's just it. Just worked out that way. And because I was able to hit golf shots, I was able to really, you know, get that bug like that makes you want to work really hard right afterwards. The breakthroughs, when I was 11, I played the Vineyard and I shot 75, and that was my first round in the 70s. And before that, I, you know, my lowest round was in the mid 80s, somewhere like 85 or something like that. That same year, I, I jumped like really far from like an 85 to 75, and then, you know, the rest is kind of history from there. I was one of the, the kids who got to scratch, I wanna say, pretty early, because I didn't start playing golf until I was 11. But I really jumped into shooting in the 70s probably that same year down to 12 and then started getting more and more under par as I got into my teenage years. And then obviously I shot some really good scores in my mid-teens. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, and then I thought I was the world beater and I was, got to about 22 or 23 still shooting those scores. And then I lost it for a good year and a half. Went to a, a coach that kind of a really... I didn't understand what he was teaching. I don't think he was a bad coach as much as I did not know how to implement any kind of swing changes. I was such like a feel player that that just completely eliminated my game getting into technicality stuff. So I lost it. I was shooting in the mid 70s for a good year and a half, two years. And then I went to go see Kelvin and I've been on the up and up ever since and uh, really excited to look forward to the future. Like I said, my last video, 2019 is going to be a crazy big year. And uh, I really do appreciate all the support from all the viewers for Formula Golf who supported me with the channel and outside of the channel throughout this last year. It's been crazy to think that, uh, that the channel's already been around for that long, but uh, we're looking forward to many more. I'll be sure to keep filming. It, they won't be as regular as always, but I promise you that I will keep posting and I promise you I will keep grinding just the same as I hope all of you do. Take it easy, everybody. Be sure to 
hit me up, follow me on Instagram, like this video, comment, and I'll answer any other questions I can, just not in front of a camera. All right, guys, remember, keep on grinding.